righty. So, look, thank you so much, everybody, for joining Louise and I today. We're quite excited about this topic because turning uncertain times into your best years yet is a pretty good thing to be able to do. And we reckon we've got some pretty good ideas for you and lots to talk about. So we're quite excited to do that. Um, you know, the problem is if you're operating a business or managing a team and you're feeling uncertain about it, you just don't make the right decisions. You wake up at night worrying about stuff. And the more certain we can be about things, the the more the the better a business, the more fun we can have in business and the better the results are. So um let me, I've only got a couple of slides. This isn't going to be death by PowerPoint, don't worry. Um, just a couple of slides at the beginning here. And why isn't that going to the next one? There we go. Um, so really to, to pull it all up into what we want to cover today, we really want to share with you ways that you can become the obvious choice for your clients and candidates, um, in, how to implement an enviable delivery model. And of course, Louise is our um, in-house expert on that and is going to take a deep dive into that for you and and help you decide what's going to shift the dial and how to stay focused on it. And really, this is going to be good for agency owners, search agency owners, uh, recruitment agency owners in small businesses, but also very much Louise's audience, the, the managers in, you know, small through to large businesses that are running teams and looking for ideas as well. So one, I think most of you probably know either Louise or myself or both of us, but uh, let's do the formalities and introduce ourselves so that you absolutely know who we've got here. So I might go to you first, Lou, and um, get you to introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you so much, Belinda. Good morning, everybody, uh, for those of you in the UK and good afternoon, those of you on the other side of the world. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, Belinda. And it's really nice to collaborate with you because I know we come across a lot of people that work with you and also work with me. And mm. so what we do is is really complimentary. Yes. Um, I'm Louise Archer. I'm the founder and coach at Retrain Search, and we teach contingent recruiters how to secure and deliver their work on a retained basis. Mm, terrific. And I have a lot of people in my program that have done Louise's program, and I've never heard anybody short of raving about it. So um, delighted oh, to have nice. you here, Louise. Likewise. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And yeah, and so for those who, who don't know me, I'm Belinda Kerr. I've spent roughly about 20 years in recruitment and I launched and sold a couple of my own agencies and for the last five years I've been working with uh, small recruitment and search agency agency owners rather uh, to help them scale and grow and really build the businesses that give them the freedom and the money that they want and so you know that means giving them predictable income and really helping them achieve what they set out to do on on day one so so that's me um, I thought just before we start, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. In fact, let me stop sharing so that we can make this a more personal experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, we feel free to drop some questions in the chat as we go along. Um, if you, if we can get to them along the way, we will. Otherwise, we've got some time at the end to absolutely answer any questions that you can throw at us. We will have you absolutely out of here within the hour. And yes, we are recording this and give us a few days and we will send it over to you. Feel free to share it with your teams or whoever you like. Keep it for, for, for prosperity, whatever, whatever you like. Um, what I would love to do is just kick off with a question and ask you what you are feeling uncertain about, just so that Louise and I can make sure that we're, you know, we're really speaking to what your concerns are we obviously have some ideas to run through but we can just shape it as we go along and make sure that it is what you're concerned about or uncertain about rather so is it or is it the word recession is it this new term I hear lately quiet quitting is it the great the great um the great resignation is it candidates is it clients going to recession yes <laughs> I thought that one might pop up what else have we got Another one going into recession. Actually, I can't see my chat. Why can't I see my chat? Lots of headcount freezes. Yep. Where have all the where have all the candidates gone? There's got to be a song in that. Managing client and candidate expectations, consistent revenue. Yep. All the things that I thought would would come up, and all the things that um, I'm sure Louise and I are hearing quite often. So there's kind of a little bit of um, comfort in knowing that we're not going through this 
individually. I have not done retained search. Hey, Mark, uh, business development versus less hiring. Okay, all right, let's kick off. So what I'd like to do first is we've got, a, we've got a pretty loose agenda. Louise and I were talking about it, and this is going to be pretty casual, but we do have a loose agenda to make sure that you walk away with tons of value from today. What I'd like to do is start by asking Lou some of the common mistakes that she sees people make that lead to uncertainty in their business. Then I'll run through some ideas and, that I've got with you, and then we'll flip back over to Louise again to go more into some strategies from her side, and then we'll have our, our Q&A. So if I can kick off by asking you that, Louise, what is it that you think are the common mistakes that you see, well, not that you think, that you see that people make when it looks to, when they're looking to create certainty in their businesses? The, I mean, the biggest, the biggest one for me, and because it sits right in um, my wheelhouse, is people working on a contingent or no win, no fee basis. Mm. Uh, it's so unpredictable. Having worked that way myself for so long, 13 years, um, I wish somebody had shown me another way far sooner than they did, but, but, but they did, and I was ready for it when they did. Um, the more that you can secure your work on a retained basis the more predictable your revenue gets it's as simple as that and um, the other thing though and it isn't just about securing uh, winning your work on a retained basis it is about delivering it as well mm. um, making sure that you've got a bulletproof deliv uh, delivery process which we're going to go into um, a little bit later on is is as important as making sure that you win the work in the first place Nicola's nodding Nicola knows how well um, <laughs> how important that is um, and the other thing that I see as a more generic um, miss, miss site really or um, oversight is not staying close enough to the client's problems. Mm. Um, I see so many people crafting solutions or trying to stay ahead of the game by building products and building services that aren't actually aligned with the problems that their clients are facing. And the, those for me are the most important things to to stay close to uh, if you're not solving your clients problems they don't need you anymore mm, exactly great thank you um anything else there Lou to add are we done there just that's checking. it for me those Didn't are want the key to cut things you for off. me <laughs> no no that's all good <laughs> all right um so I'm going to look a little more specifically now at opportunities to create certainty in your business I thought about this a lot before uh, we caught up on this call and I have 11 points. Look, there's there's more, but when I was thinking about what to share today, because I could go on for hours about this, I was looking to really give you things that you can take today and start to implement because, you know, if you can just take one or two things away from today that are going to make a difference for you and feel help you feel more confident and certain about your business, then that's a good thing, right? So number one, and this is one that I've put at the top of the list because it's one that I see people struggle with. And this is about focusing on today at the expense of building for tomorrow. Um, this is this is just as important for managers as it is for business owners. Um, but what I see all too often is we're trained as recruiters to focus on the here and now, get that job in, get that done. But it often comes at the expense of building for tomorrow. And if you're not building for tomorrow, you're just going to always stay on that hamster wheel and be wondering about what's coming next. So, so much of the certainty in your business will be a direct result of planning for tomorrow. And just to give you, make that a little bit more real and give you an example, if you're a business who's hiring consultants and we're kind of the, the operating under that modus operandi of, oh, my God, we've had another consultant leave, we need to find somebody. And then you, you go into a tailspin, you call some rector rex, you, you know, think about putting some ads up, talking to people, how are you going to get to find this person? Versus if that's an issue in your business and it's an ongoing challenge versus giving it the time that it needs to have a pipeline of, you know, good consultants for not just now but for the future. So looking at spending, you know, whatever time that should be a week, perhaps it's a few hours, depending on your business, and engaging with people, it could be well before they're looking to leave. So if you're in accounting and finance recruitment, mapping out who are all the, you know, the talent, the rising talent that are coming through, connecting with those people, organizing to have X amount of coffees a week, or I'm, I'm not sort of giving you this as an exact strategy. I'm just trying to pull out the example of what 
what you could be focusing on. If that's a problem in your business and you're waiting until somebody leaves before you try and find somebody, that's a missing and that's upsetting the boat and that's making you very uncertain about being able to deliver for clients because you haven't got consultants. So um, that's just, a, I guess, an example there to show you. And there's hundreds more within your businesses. Um, a very good example of focusing on um, tomorrow and what that can bring you versus today. And of course, the thing is, well, how do you balance that? And I always say to people, just draw that line in the sand. You're either recruiting or you're building. Don't try and mix it all up and do both at once because it's it's just too painful. Um, and, and feeding into that is having a plan and a goal, like what does your future business look like? Um, too often I speak to people and they've just got a bit of a hairy understanding of what that might be. It's not really filled out. Um, and if you shoot for nothing, you'll get it right. So um, we want to know what that looks like. The other thing I want to say about that is we want to do that irrespective of what's going on today. So when I asked in the chat what was going on, it was about candidates, about the recession, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're always reacting to what's happening in the current market and you haven't got any bandwidth for future business, it makes it very hard to be certain about what's coming and, and, and you know, be building the business that you want. Um, if you've got a business that is running really well, you can ride these bumps. So, for example, recessions, when they when they hit us, we, they feel like they're going to be here forever. Recessions typically only last on average for 10 months. Um, candidates and client markets are cyclical and we have to have those because if that wasn't a problem, we wouldn't have any clients. And, you know, we see there's other market fluctuations. So the secret is to build a strong business for the long term that can weather any fluctuations. So can you see how if you can do that, that would give you a sense of a sense of certainty. Hmm. Tied in with that is your cash runway. So if you're, I was having a conversation with the other day, somebody the other day who um, was worried about the recession. And I said, "Well, how how big is your how long is your cash runway?" And what I'm talking about there is um, from today. If nobody, um, you didn't place any jobs from now and you still had your fixed expenses and you didn't get another pound or another dollar in the bank, how long would it be until you ran out of business? And this person said to me, two years, and but was still worried about the current market. Now, really, there isn't anything to worry about there. There's plenty of time within that to keep scaling and growing and ride, ride that because the recession, unless it changes to what it did in the past, will be gone by then. So if your business is, I don't know if you guys can see my arm here, but if your business is up here and it's strong, and then the good and the bad times are coming under here and you're just kind of riding those speed bumps as you go, um, you're okay. But if you're running a business where you have one or two months runway, it's a very, very different strategy. You absolutely need to be getting money in the door or, um, you know, the results won't be, won't be good for you. So then it's not about investing and spending in the future. It's about getting the cash in the door so that you've then got a runway for when um, you know, for, for when you need it. And what our parents always taught us, you know, put some money away for rainy days. That That's very much the case here. Um, and as Louise touched on as well, you want to know what's happening in your market. Now is a very good time because things are changing so quickly. You really want to be speaking to your market and getting not just a sense, but a full understanding of, of what their plans are so that you can build your strategy according to what's going on. Your candidates and your clients are the reason we exist. Um, so we want to be speaking to clients about what they're feeling, you know, what, what, are, what are their concerns about the imminent recession if it happens? What, what are they feeling about not being able to get clients in Canada? Are they, are they planning on hiring in six to 12 months? Are they putting things on hold? Somebody said in the chat, you know, having, um, having Rex withdrawn. If you know what the client's plans are and you know broadly what your, what, what are your candidates' motivators? You'll be able to plan accordingly to a point. I know we don't live in a perfect world, but we can we can plan as best as best we can. So that's that was my number three. My number four is focusing on things within your control. Don't spend so much time on Facebook and in echo chambers and listening to the local hairdresser about you know how it's doomsday. Listen to the. Um, I, you know, the the um, respected financial and economic forecasts and be mindful, but don't get sucked into it. It's, you know, it, the, we've, we've been down this path before. This isn't a new radio, um, rodeo rather. There's three things that will 
control your success. One is the economy. You can't do anything about that. So you just have to be mindful of it. And unless you're running the country, perhaps you can. But where most of us are sitting, we can't. And then, of course, there's your mindset. Um, and if you've been knocked around a little bit and, you, and your mindset is a little bit uh, rattled, then we need to work on that so that you are in, if you've got a really powerful mindset, you'll make better decisions for your business. And then the third thing, of course, is getting into the right action. And, you know, we're going to talk about some actions here today that you can that you can take away. Number five, only spend time and money on the things that will move the dial for you. And a good thing to do here is a bit of tactical diversion here is to audit yourself and your business. And by that, I mean, as you go through the week, and I know this is easier said than done while you're sitting here on a webinar, but if you can, as you go through the week, just write down what you're doing and then question it. Why are you doing it? Should you stop it? Should, should you do it differently? How could you make it more efficient? Is it something that you could delegate or outsource to somebody else? Um, recruit, you know, for those of you, especially for those of you who've been in recruitment a while, when you started, the landscape and what works is very different now, but we're creatures of habit. And I can promise you there'll be things in your business that you're doing that are just a legacy of the past. And they're hidden from your view until you kind of go digging for them to see what they could they could be. So um, we can start to get rid of some of the wastage in there, not strictly um talking to certainty in your business, but the better we can make your business, the more certain it, the more certain your results will be. And that, that's what we're here to do today. Um, what it, yeah, so what are the things that you could stop? Have a look at your P&L. What are you, what's on your um, profit and loss that might be a little bit extra? I had, um, I had an experience the other day where I, because tech's changing all the time, I had some a couple of pieces of tech on my P&L that I'd never even used, but I'd signed up because I wanted to try something, then I forgot, and then I noticed it coming off my, my credit card again. So what sort of stuff in your business are you spending that you might not even know about, particularly those who are getting a little bit bigger, because some of those costs can, can add up. Um, number six, where are you vulnerable to, actually, I just want to check in. How am I going? Because I, I know I talk so fast. Am I just give me a nod if it's all okay? Those of you that are on, yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, where are you vulnerable in your business? Are you beholden to third party platforms like LinkedIn? If LinkedIn closed tomorrow, what would happen to your business? Are you using it as a database? Please tell me no. Um, if you're building a business on LinkedIn, it's like you know building a house on rented land. We want all your contacts and and people. Uh, all your contacts in um, in your community and where nobody can take them away from you. Um, web security, if can someone, you know, is that, if you've got all that uh, bedded down. Terms of business, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take much for somebody to prove, like to, to, um, to question your terms of business and, and get away with it. Um, did you do what lots of people do if, you, if you've got your own business? Did you kind of copy and paste and then change it from there? Or have you actually gone and, you know, to a lawyer and, and had it done, had it done properly? So just looking for any vulnerabilities in your business. Um, seven, looking for some wins internally to maximize what you already have. One of the big ones that, all, that always pops up here is people's databases. Um, if you've got if you've been in business for a while or, or if you're managing a team and it, within a company that's got a big database, is it like a graveyard or is it something that's skilled, it's coded and you're using really well and you're getting money from it? If you think about, you know, people leaving jobs every two or three years and you've got anything more than a few thousand people on your database, you've got tons of money in there that you can that you can get to. So some easy internal um, wins. Uh, clients, it's not so much internal, but clients that you've already got that you could get more business from or more referrals from. Um, when when we're busy and it's candidate short and we're and there's lots and lots of jobs out, we can just get busy chasing our tails and sometimes miss what's right in front of us. So that's why I wanted to put that one in there. Um, hey, this is a huge one, and it's it's a tough one for people, and it might seem a little bit. Um, not so important, but it is. So thinking time, how much time, I'm going to ask you guys this actually and type in the chat, how much time do you give yourself now to just sit down, have a cup of tea or a coffee, or if it's, you know, maybe you need a scotch, just to sit there and look out the window and think. Just give me a type, type in the chat there, be honest, no, no sneaky, no sneaky addings in there if you're, if you're not doing it. How much time 
do you, thinking time do you give yourself? Lots. Oh, that's good. Once a week. Does this count as thinking time? No, this does not count as thinking time. <laughs> so this isn't, I'm not talking about time working on your business. I'm just talking about where you sit down, you do nothing, you have a cup of tea and you just let your brain, you know, click over. I can't see any more answers coming through. Away from the laptop, yes, journal, that sort of thing. Meditating, love it, good, okay. Most of Many of the masters over time, um, you know, they spent a lot of time just thinking um, because if you don't give yourself that thinking time, how do you start to formulate projects that are really going to drive, you know, incoming business? How do you test delivery models to see if they're working? How do you come up with great ways to get a consultant pipeline if you're, if you're really short of, of getting people in your team? Um, it just It's like a reboot on a computer. It's really, really important. Number nine, two more, uh, three more left. So understand how your market buys now and what tools you have at your fingertips to leverage this. We know, um, and it's not just recruitment, it's everything. We know that um, people have 70% made up their minds whether or not to use you before they speak to you. That's incredible. So learn how to reach your market at scale, learn how to reach the people that you, you, uh, that you don't know yet and influence them so that when they reach you, they're ready to use you. Very, very big shift. You know, it used to be the other way around. It was more sales led. Now it's more marketing led. So um, I bought a washing machine not long ago and I did, it was a Simpson washing machine. I didn't look at anything about Simpson. I just looked at the reviews. I was about to buy one and then there was these negative reviews of one and then there was positive on another. Which one do I buy? The one that had the positive reviews. And we're no different to washing machines, unfortunately, <laughs> apparently. And it, the same applies. So the more you can have people know, like, and trust you before they even speak to you, um, that's going to give you certainty of, of candidate and client flow. Um, number 10, actively create a point of difference. Um, your clients want certainty too. And when they're looking at the, when candidates and clients are looking at who to use, they're trying to put you in a box or out of a box. Can they help me? Can't they help me? And if you're just saying the same thing as everybody else, we place accountants in San Francisco and we've been in the business for 20 years and we're great because we're different. We do things better. That's what everyone else is saying. Now, this is kind of another, almost another webinar in itself, but it's really important that you find ways to be different, not just say you're different, but show that you are different within your market. And that becomes a buying factor for your market. So again, something probably for another day, but still um, worth a mention here today. And um, and last but not least, and this is where I'm going to um, divert back to Lou because she's obviously the expert in this one, is to create the best delivery model for your market that and that creates uh, guaranteed revenue. So that's a lovely little segue back into to Lou because she can take a, a deep dive into that. And um, what I really love about what Louise does is that she makes retained business so accessible for, um, for people that probably until they chat with her, feel like it's a little bit of a, a bit out of reach for them. So so Lou, I guess just to kick off on that then, how does how do you feel the um the retain piece plays into our topic today? You touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but let's just take it a bit deeper. Um, thanks, Belinda. God, there's so much there. I've been making notes myself all the way through. Uh, you've been talking. <laughs> so um for me my my special specialist subject is is working on a retained basis and so everything that i has that's happened for me um in in transitioning from contingent to retained has done exactly uh, what we've been talking about this morning and that's created certainty for me hmm. um not just um in um my, my business when i did end up working for myself but also when i was working within a much bigger business. So um, it's a model that I advocate hugely and particularly as we go into times where we're really, we're not sure what that landscape's going to look like. The relationships that we have on a contingent basis are so um, fragile and so tenuous that that um, it makes sense to um, use this time now where, where it is still relatively buoyant um, I would say at the moment, um, 
there are many, many hiring companies still hiring and still struggling to find the talent that they need um, to be able to secure that work and those relationships on a retained basis. And you'll be moving into the next um, chapter in a much stronger position. So I talked earlier about the importance of being able to win that work on a retained basis, but um, it's almost more important that you can deliver it before you win it in the first place. Um, and being confident in your ability to be able to deliver, deliver it is a, a huge part of being able to win it. Yes. So the two are inextricably uh, interlinked. And the piece that most people don't know is what that delivery model looks like and what a retained delivery model should be. There are so many misconceptions. I talk about misconceptions um, of retained search because I had them myself as to what it actually is and what it means to work on a retained basis. And not many people actually know why a client will uh, commit to making an investment on commencement of a project over and above working on a no win, no fee basis. Lots of people think that it's some kind of magical mystery, dark art, some kind of um, headhunting thing that only expensive suited um, uh, search consultants in the big cities can, can do. Some people think that it's just about money up front and actually it isn't any different. And, and it's all a load, of, a load of rubbish and smoke and mirrors. Um, not many people actually know what it is. And so what I wanted to do today was um, talk through what the retained delivery process looks like um, and why it gives us certainty in the delivery of our assignments. So <clears throat> one of the things that we, we have to do when we're working on a retained basis is provide certainty for the, for the client. They're not going to commit to making an investment in us if what we're saying is actually we think we can deliver or we're pretty sure that we can deliver a result or we are very confident that we might be able to. Um, that's not that's not good enough. And that's a lot of the time where contingent recruiters will fall down in the sales process. Incidentally, they'll talk about adding bells and whistles like video interviewing or um face-to-face uh, -face interviewing or they'll talk about behavioral profiling or they'll talk about mapping the market but when it comes down to well what is the outcome going to be they then either do one or two things either promise to find the perfect candidate yes I absolutely will find the perfect candidate or be doubtful about that and there's an element of yeah I'm pretty sure that we can do it I really believe that we can um, so what I wanted to do was just explain that when, as consultants, we can't promise that we can find the perfect candidate. And the mistake that some people make when they first start uh, positioning and selling retained is that they do do that. They make that promise. We, we can't do it. We don't know whether that perfect candidate exists. We don't know if that perfect candidate does exist, if, if they actually want, will want to come and work for the client. We're not magicians and we're not manufacturing people here. So it, it's it's very dangerous to promise a, candidate, a client that you're going to find their perfect candidate. You're talking about things that are in your control and not in your control. That is definitely not in, mm -hmm. in your control. But what we can guarantee, and this is what to focus on, what we can guarantee is that we can take a thorough brief from that client, that we can align that brief with what does exist in the market, using our knowledge and using our expertise and our experience that we can systematically identify all of the candidates that look to meet that brief within an any given area across target companies. We can also guarantee that we can take the most compelling message possible to every single one of those candidates and that we can bring to the table all of those that is humanly possible to bring to the table. And we can guarantee at the end of that process that the client is going to be making their decision from every candidate that is available to them in the market at this time. And that's the certainty that we can give our clients when we work on a retained basis. And that's the same certainty that we can have when we're delivering 
projects. So we can say with absolute certainty that we can put our client in a position at the end of every single project where they are making their decision from every candidate that is available to them in the market at this time, without a doubt. And that's what the client buys. You can't do that on a contingent basis. It's too risky. You could get halfway through that process and the client say, actually, I've just decided to put a pin in this for the moment, or we've decided to do something else. Without the um, commitment from the client on a a financial commitment from the client and that process that you've both agreed to following, it's not commercially viable to execute um, a search in that way. So I don't advise you putting that in place for contingent um, agreements or contingent recruitment. But if a client is looking for anybody, will do, or they're not bothered if the position sits open for a while, uh, they don't mind putting somebody in the position and there might actually be somebody better for it, then a contingent approach works just fine. But if they're looking to make sure that they're making the best hire that is available to them, then the only way to do that is to put in place a um, guaranteed delivery process that will make sure that they're in the position that they know for certain, without doubt, they're making the best hire available to them at this moment. How's that going down with everybody? Any questions? You're getting some love love from (laughs) Nicola, who did your course and loved it. (laughs) A hundred percent success on all retained projects as a result. That's brilliant. Really, really, really good. Yeah. And the thing is, when when you're um, when you're working in this way and putting in a process like this, you can't fail. You can't fail because you're 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 not committing to find the perfect candidate. You're committing to put your client in the position where they're making their decision from everything that is available to them. That might mean that they don't like what's available to them and they don't want to hire what's available to them. But you're, that's not your job. Your job is to put them in that position in the first place, not to make the decision at the end of the day. That's so powerful. How's that going down with um, with everyone else? Kerry, you say you love that. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Great stuff. Love it, Lou. Andy Thank Sama. you. Where Anybody got you... worries or queries around it? The steering Hi, meeting, meeting and market intel. Yeah. Hi, Hi Louise. I'm, I'm quite interested in when you approach the client, it's about the terms yeah. and conditions, because they'll be quite different, these terms and conditions, to what I use. And yeah. do, you, do you talk them through it and try and get them to sign it? Um, do you ever have any hesitations? Because if I'm going to do this way of thinking, which I think is fantastic, um, by the way, and I will probably join your course, um, <laughs> do, do, you, do you ever get any kickbacks? on it because I've worked with a lot of these clients I'm dealing with at the moment and so they're very used to having a tremendous amount of freebies out of me and um and you know and and this morning in the UK British papers recession recession interest rates going up 5.5 percent and people you know we, we are now officially I think going into this horrendous recession um but yeah I'm really interested in the terms and conditions and how you get them to sign it and then you know, I'm, I think I'm, I've, I've made all the points of talking them through why it's really a positive outcome for, you know, giving these, you know, selecting the retained business. But, yeah, I'm really interested in how it took you to um, get them to sign okay. the terms and conditions and work with you. OK. All right. Good question. Thanks, Louise. Um, so. It's great that you've jotted down some of the benefits. That's brilliant. Um, you can clearly see that this is going to put them in a different position and working in this way um, enables them to make a decision that, you know, the analogy that I quite often use and Jordan and I use quite often is the travel agent analogy. Nicola's probably heard us use this um, before. But imagine you walk into a travel agent and you're booking a holiday. I presume you've got travel agents in Australia. It's the same as UK. Yeah. You're booking a holiday. You've got um, you want a hotel on the beach. You've got kids. You want a kids club. You want to be near a local town so you can walk in for dinner and, and, and. Right. And the travel agent says, OK, great. I understand what you're looking for. Um, I'll I'll, I'll have a look at everything that um, is available in that area and I'll send them to you as I come across them. So you go away, you get a couple of hotels on day one. A few days later, you get another few. A few days later, you get another few. By the fifth or sixth hotel, you're thinking, what was the pool like in that? first hotel again imagine a different scenario and imagine they say okay I understand what you're looking for you go away in two weeks time come back 
and I'll show you all of the hotels that most closely fit your criteria. And you can make a decision as to which one you want to go to. And if you like, I'll also show you the ones that I've rejected, just for you, so you're sure that I'm, I'm making the right decision. How much easier is it for you to make that decision? Such a good analogy. So I'm really glad. I'm really glad that you've 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 seen that that is putting them in a different position. I mean, you might not need it. You might just think I don't care where I go. In which case, fine. Um, send them to me, and the one that I think looks nicest, I'll go. Most hiring companies, when we're drafted in to help them there's some kind of criticality to it. It's not just anybody. Sometimes it's different if you're recruiting warehouse packers. And that's why I say it isn't always necessary to apply a retained solution. There are lots of cases, low level, straightforward, lots of candidates available where it just isn't necessary. If they just want somebody, they just want any old hotel, then fine, the contingent model is perfectly adequate. So I'm pleased that you've identified that um, uh, that this puts the client in, diff in a different position than it does. And it's great that you've wrote down the benefits, but if it was as easy as selling it on that, then everybody would already be doing it. Um, and, and sadly, it isn't quite that straightforward. So I'm just going to pick up on that bit before I then answer your second question about the terms of business. Um, it, it's, it's what I alluded to before about staying close to your client's problems. And somebody quite rightly said, well, isn't the problem that they can't find the candidates themselves? Yes, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's that they've got six months of hiring and they've got 25 hires to make over six months and one or two would be fine, but 25 is going to be really bloody difficult. Sometimes it's that they've got so many coming in, they can't sort through them all. Sometimes they've got nobody coming in and they just don't know where they, so the problem does kind of vary. Um, but the reason I'm going back to the problem is that that's how you sell it. If what they're getting at the moment is working for them, if they're getting what they want, when they want it, and it's an enjoyable process, you're going to find it very difficult, no matter how loud you shout about the benefits of retained, to get them to change what they're doing. So it isn't just about selling on benefit. It's about its solution sales. It's about unpicking the problem and making the problem that they've got at the moment bigger. And getting them sometimes, in many cases, getting them to realize that, that it's a problem in the first place that can actually be solved. Most clients, A, aren't, won't admit that they've got a problem, and B, are definitely not aware that there's a solution. Most clients don't know that there's a better way of doing it. They think exec search is just for executive and senior positions. So start with the problem, unpick that. Do you get what you want when you want it? Is it an enjoyable process? Is, the con is this model working for you? If they say yes, leave it alone. You're wasting your breath trying to convince them to do something different. If they say no, we need more candidates or we're inundated with, with people that aren't right or we hate recruiters, which is quite often the case. Great, there's a problem there and this model can fix it. So let me talk through how there is a better way of working. Let me talk you through what it looks like. And then let me show you on this one project. OK, so that's that's in a nutshell, in a very, very, very condensed um, format. Um, well, the 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 basis behind positioning it. Louise, Someone was, was going to say something. No, that was just yeah, Belinda. I was just going to say, where would you recommend somebody starts when they're when they're reconsidering delivery model? They might have been doing contingent for years and they go, OK, I can see that this could be good. Where, where do they start in that, in that? I mean, obviously you can help them, but where do they start with that process? Well, the, the, first pro, the first thing is that asking that question, are my clients getting what they want when they want it? And is it an enjoyable process? Yeah. Okay. Because if they are, it's very difficult for you to suggest that they should be doing something differently. So if, you, if you're in a market where there's plenty of candidates available, you pop an advert on, you fire a few CVs over, clients happy days, A, why would they change anything? And B, why would you? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 the reason that, and, the, and the basis for making that decision to change your delivery model and the sales model is whether there's a problem in the first place. Now, mm. sometimes the problem's on the client side in that they're not getting what they want when they want it and it's not an enjoyable process and they're frustrated. Sometimes the problem's on our side. Sometimes we're vulnerable. Working on a no-win, no-fee basis means we're working at risk. Mm. And the problem might be that we're getting landed in it quite often so we're working on projects and then clients are saying actually we've decided to do this or we've decided to do that and that isn't working for us and that's a conversation we need to have with the client to explain are you getting what you want yes I'm perfectly happy okay well I'm not though <laughs> there's I've got a problem here and it's not working for me so I want to carry on doing what we're doing but this is what it's going to need to look like for me to be able to carry on doing what I'm doing for you it's really interesting okay. when I um when I go through with people and 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 the people I help are, are small agency owners you know that sort of one to ten zone and I ask them about the delivery model 
And they say, oh, no, no, I can't sell retain. Um, you know, my market's not up for it, et cetera. And I'll say to them, so how? when's the last time you asked somebody? And they go, oh, never or, you know, not for a long time. And so I think sometimes, Louise, it's a matter of, you know, you don't ask, you don't get either. Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. There are there are lots of lots and lots and lots of people that I mean I didn't mention that as a misconception that think that it won't work in their market or it's just for senior and executive positions and it's absolute um, well bollocks basically. <laughs> you don't mind me me using that expression. Um, yeah, I've I mean I I win retain projects and we still do. We're doing one at the moment that isn't particularly senior um, for you know the equivalent of maybe thirty five k AUD based salaries. Um, but but they can't find the people they're looking for. Yeah. So it, it doesn't it doesn't matter what level and it doesn't matter what market we teach people in mining, you know, in, in Perth. Um, it, these people have never heard of a retained model before. It's just an education. In fact, what I say is a market where retained is already established and clients are already using that model is much, much, much harder to win retained work in because you're competing against more sophisticated search firms and they're much harder to win against. Selling against the contingent model is easy. So if your market is contingent and they don't know what retained is, happy days. You be the first one there to say, by the way, do you know it doesn't have to be like this? Do you know yes, there's a different way yes. of working? It doesn't need to be more expensive. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. It, it is a different way of working that produces different results. Let me show you. That's but remember, it all starts with that problem. So, Louise, I'm not avoiding your question. I'll come round to the answer to where I'm getting to, which is it starts with the problem and getting them to admit that the way it's working at the moment isn't isn't ideal. Um, And then moving on to what we would like to do instead and what that looks like. And so the first piece of paper or the first collateral piece of collateral that we put in front of them isn't the terms of business. It's walking through what that looks like and how we do it. And that's what they buy. They don't buy a set of terms. The terms are almost, I mean, the last, the search we're doing at the moment, they haven't even signed terms. I've, I'm completely protected. They've paid the first stage. The second stage is due next week when the shortlist is finished. I'm, if that client at any point messes me about, I'll stop and walk away. They need me far more than, than I need them. But I'm not saying that, so I'm not suggesting that's best practice and you should have a set of terms that protects you, but it would sit at the end of a proposal that you've walked through with them. And they know what this is going to look like. So together, yes, you're right in that. Do you agree that with them? Do you talk them through it? Yes, but it's not a terms of business document. It's a way we're going to work. It's our methodology that they buy. Does that make sense? Louise, there's a question. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, Louise. There's a question. There's a question here from Brian saying, would you like to just speak to this one, Louise? It's retained equals RPO question mark. We're saying equals RPO. Um, I'd say no. But. No, I would. My, I mean, it's all subjective, isn't it? But um, I would say no. In my experience, RPO is um, outsourcing of the entire recruitment process. Mm-hmm. Usually, when you work on a retained basis, the client is still. And, and the way I like to work on a retained basis, we had a steering call with our client yesterday. We're having, and Nicola mentioned steering calls at every step of the process. The client is quite heavily involved. They have to see our workings. So I talked earlier about putting in the bulletproof delivery process, making the making sure that you're systematically identifying all of the candidates, making sure that you're systematically approaching them all. A huge part of that is sharing that data and sharing that with the client and being totally transparent about what you're doing. Mm. In an RPO situation, no, that wouldn't happen because we're taking full responsibility for the uh, recruitment mm. process, including all the interviewing. Whereas when a, in a retained situation, um, I want the client to be doing their share of the interviewing. I'll uh, shortlist competency-based assess um, and the client will do the second and final interview stages. We've got a few questions coming through for you. We might as well um, divert in t- into that. We've got, um, so um, Alex is saying, what's your definition of retained? Full fee is guaranteed or just just a kickoff fee or what's the fee schedule? Thanks, Alex, for your question. Um, so, so that's a really good question, Alex. Thank you. Um, the definition of retained for me, and I always say that, um, it, you know, there's no right or wrong way of doing any of this. This is just my experience that I'm sharing here, my experience and having taught 
a fair few hundreds of recruiters um, now as well, but that uh, some financial commitment from the client enables us to put in place a robust and thorough search process and enables us to commit to working with them to reach a result. It's quite carefully worded that. Mm. Notice that I've said that we'll commit to working with them until we reach a result, not commit to working with them until they make their perfect hire. Um, and that we're putting in place a robust and thorough search process. They must engage with that. All those three things are really key. Um, in terms of the fee schedule, traditionally it's a third, a third, a third. Traditionally, it's a third of base salary. Um, um, I'm not a fan of tradition and I'm a big believer in flexibility. Um, for me, I'm quite comfortable at 25%, but anything over 20%, depending on your market, um, can work on a retained basis. I would never take less than a third on commencement. So a token gesture of a couple of thousand I've had a really bad experience of that. So if you are just going to take an engagement fee and then the rest on completion, in my experience, that's fine and that can work really well. There's no need to insist on the three stages, but don't take less than a third on commencement. Um, and anything below 20%, depending on your market, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, it doesn't make it commercially viable to take the amount of steps that you need to take mm. to deliver it. Cool. Get, we may as well, I think we've got some questions coming through, so we might as well just switch over to those. Um, any questions for either myself or Louise, but this one's definitely from you, Louise. How would one split fees when, so thank, sorry, thank you, Brian. Um, how would one split fees when you are retained, but you get candidates from someone else, another, in brackets, another recruiter, how do you share the retainer? Do you have any guidelines? And so... Do you, you mean that you're working in conjunction with somebody else on the project? Um, or the, yeah, go on, Brian. So, so I, I'm part of a, I suppose, an umbrella body called the NPA, NPA Worldwide, mm -hmm. and uh, within that, uh, we get to share both uh, candidates and jobs. So uh, we have a platform called Matchmaker, and, and so someone will come in and say, "Listen, I've got this, I've got this um, opportunity where they're looking for accountants in Western." Australia and I just happen to be a, a recruiter for accountants accountants in Western Australia I say hey I got some lots of great candidates uh, within the uh, rules of NPA you say great that's a 50 50 split there are already engagement rules there give me your three candidates they hire a candidate and you split the fees and give pay a brokerage fee to NPA okay so, okay so, yeah. so that works very well on a contingency basis however mm -hmm. let's just say that um, one firm gets a retainer, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 20% up front, and I provide the, that firm with three candidates. And uh, it comes to a situation whereby, oh, look, and I don't, I don't, I, I, like they decide, oh, we can't find, they find a candidate else, elsewhere. And I've already gone through the search. I've already gone, you know, the Boolean searches and contacted guys, gotten resumes, sent them over, make sure that they were right speak to my partner in this retained search uh, collaboration, uh, but they don't give me, a, a, like, should you be offering me some of the retainer? Because I'm actually doing all the, the work involved with the retainer, you know, I, I'm actually doing all the work. They've just, they're just hosting the 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 role with the national client. Sorry, my dog's away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are lots of different, your question is pertinent for anybody splitting the delivery, even internally, where you've got one person winning the work and somebody else delivering it, um, which which was the case, has been the case for me in in quite a few different situations. And I, my advice would always be that you split the fee 50-50 between the person that's won it and the person that's delivering it. Including the retainer. Like sometimes, you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Because as you said yourself, the result might not necessarily be a higher at all. Whereas... The guy with the candidates has done all the work. The other guy's just gone waiting for them. Waiting it, 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 for them. it is, as I said right at the start, it is as important to deliver it as it is winning it. There's no point winning it in the, if, if you can't delivering it, deliver it. Um, if you can't deliver it, don't go out and win it in the first place. Um, and so a lot of what we do in our course is ensure that you have the confidence and the clarity of delivery process to make sure that you are 
absolutely um, certain of your ability to be able to deliver. And that's what creates the confidence around the cell. So Brian, in, in answer to your question, um, yes, delivery is as important as the win and it should be divided accordingly. The way that we used to do it um, is that we used to split the first stage um, used to go the the percentage of the first stage payment did used to go to the person that had won the project. The percentage of the second stage uh, payment used to go to the person that delivered the project and then both parties would get an equal share of the completion stage and that meant that both parties were incentivized to a win projects they could deliver from a BD perspective and b deliver the projects if you were on the delivery side. So the uh, they were both driven to um, achieve the result. Cool. I might, because we're getting close to on the hour now, I might get anyone who's got any more questions is to type them in the chat box there. And I just want to go back. Casey asked a question early on about, um, I think it was Casey, about um, what sort of runway we were talking about cash flow runway it does change a little bit from business to business and, and where you're at and what sort of market you're in but um, you know if you obviously the more the better but I would say a minimum of six months and I think one of the problems with a lot of people I speak to is they start their businesses before they have enough cash in the pot and then they're always scrambling to get ahead so anything north of, of six months the other problem is that um, without that people will hire too soon without that cash runway and that just completely exposes you because you're it's there is so much variables when you bring a, a, a new consultant into a business you're training them when you were you know you were spending um, more time recruiting that sort of thing so at least at least six months but ideally more would be my answer I don't know what you think to that Lou would you agree with that number um yeah, six months ideally. I mean, um, I'm I'm working on my own war chest, as we call it. Um, I'd like to get up to twelve months. That person that's in a two year position is enviable. Uh, six months would be good. That, that'll be really comfortable. We're not far yeah. off, but that would be great. I've got a couple of questions for you, actually, Belinda. Um, Have you? <laughs> if, if nobody minds me asking you questions while we're here. Um, quite a lot of um, the people that I work with um, are making decisions whether to hire or whether to outsource. Mm. Mm, what advice would you have, um, you know, particularly for positions like researchers, they're winning retained work consistently now and not sure whether to make a permanent hire or whether to outsource the research? What, what advice would you give them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think if so, there's a couple of things. If you're wanting flexibility, then outsourcing and offshoring is a great option because you can turn off the tap and turn on the tap. And you can, you know, you might want one person, you might want 10 people, you can get them, you know, in a day if you really want to. Obviously, you have to train them. So flexibility is a really good reason to do that. And also, if you're trying to iron things out before you hire somebody internally, which is typically going to cost more than if you offshore it, not always, but you, you know, sometimes if you're trying to iron out your process and and do that, um, that's another reason to do that. And I think um, the other thing to think about when thinking about offshoring or, or hiring locally is there is so much more available now. Like every year, there's more and more things becoming available with off with offshoring, um, and the 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 level of professionalism is increasing. So I hear a lot of a lot of stories where people say to me, oh, you know, I tried to use a VA and it, you know, all fell in a heap. And it usually fell in a heap because there was mismatched expectations and a, and a lack of training. But when it's done well and it, the people are onboarded and they worked as if they do work in the team, you know, it can work work really well. So there's lots of um, lots of okay. lots of reasons to to actually um, to use. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. There's a there's a um, th what they can deliver on an offshore. Um, basis is getting closer and closer to what you could do internally as well. I know Rod's on the call here who works, who um, represents IMS and they have thousands of people, literally thousands of people doing um, doing offshore work, outsourcing and, and some of the bigger companies like Michael Page and those sorts of businesses that you never would have thought would have used those services are really engaging them um, in very smart ways. So I would, I would seriously look at it. And Rod says, um... He's quite right. If you need more incentive, retained adds value to your business. So the reason that I ended up going, moving to retain in the first place, which I never, by the way, thought was even possible. I was in the camp of pretty much everybody that comes to me going, I don't think this is possible for me, but can you tell me a bit more? And I was like even further away from thinking that it was possible. Um, but the um, 
the reason that I did was the company that I was working for was predominantly contract and their core business was contracts and they were taking investment from a, a VC. They were going to go through a transaction. The perm business was kind of a, an ugly little sister and was just a, a necessary evil. And what they said was when they valued the business that it had no value, none at all, because it was so unpredictable. There was no predictability in the revenue forecasts. It was so wildly different every time mm. that we forecast it. In the, in the business for a, a month, even on a monthly basis, it was dreadfully inaccurate. So they said it's valueless to us. Either you shore up the revenue and make it guaranteed and forecastable or we close it down yep. and we'd, we're not interested in it. That's how how worthless an unpredictable business is. Yeah, we turned wow. that business. I mean, long story short, we turned that business fully retained. It now does um, $12 million, if not more. Last count, it was $12 million globally in retained business and everything that they do is retained. And, and it survived and it's a it's a massive asset to that company now. The difference between having a contingent business and having a retained business in terms of value is night and day. Yeah, amazing. Well, we're getting up to the hour. My God, that's gone fast. I just want to share my screen mm-hmm. again and let you know where you can contact either one of the beautiful ladies that helped hosted this today um did now did that work hang on a second it didn't work there we go can you see my screen yep hopefully it's the right one and it's not the other one that i've got all rubbish all over um so yeah so if you if you're into the qr codes you can you can shoot shoot that there um or reach out to Lou on email, louise at retrainsearch.com or check her out on her website or me, Belinda at recruitmentgarage.com. Um, happy to help, happy to help with any questions as in as is, I'm sure Lou is. <laughs> Say that yeah, quickly. absolutely. Um, more than happy to stay on for a couple more minutes if you guys have some more questions or equally if you need to go set you free. And I will just stop sharing that now. Um Thank you so much, Belinda. It's been brilliant chatting to you. I hope that it's been helpful it's been and interesting for people to listen to. Fast and furious. We'll get you out the recording. Thank you so much for joining everybody. I hope you found it useful. And thank you so much, Louise, for coming with us today.